Ultima 3 was the final game in what would come to be known as the Age of Darkness trilogy. These first three games told simple stories of the powers of good overcoming insurmountable odds and conquering evil. They also represented the Dark Ages of Ultima, experimenting sometimes clumsily but establishing a foundation for something more ambitious. The Age of Darkness would now come to an end, but what would replace it? Ultima 3 was Origin's first major release and its first major success. Despite the financial windfall, however, Origin was still a tiny coalition of friends programming, providing customer support, and shipping thousands of boxes out of the Garriott family garage. It was probably time to expand, but first they'd need to overcome a logistical problem. Richard's brother, Robert, the co-founder of Origin and an indispensable figure in its operations, had recently moved across the country due to his wife's work. They'd packed up and made for the town of North Andover, Massachusetts, about a 30-hour drive from his office in Houston. This was obviously untenable. That 30-hour drive would kill Origin, Robert, or his marriage. Necessity, as they say, is the mother of invention, and while Robert Garriott didn't invent the Cessna aircraft, he did own one, and a pilot's license. Robert would fly back and forth between Texas and Massachusetts, spending three weeks of every month in Houston and one week back home with his family. While business was able to continue as usual, this wasn't an ideal arrangement. The members of Origin decided, with nothing tying them down, they'd pack up and move their studio across the country. It'd be a fresh start for a group of young guys who felt the world was their oyster, but the transition would be difficult. Packing up their office equipment, the crew traveled through one of the fiercest blizzards of the decade. They arrived in North Andover during a particularly long, dark, and cold winter. The reception they were being given by the locals was similarly icy. The Texas boys and their newfangled computer gadgets were eyed with suspicion by the townsfolk. This compounded with their friends and family being thousands of miles away, their lack of winter driving prowess resulting in several totaled vehicles, and numerous robberies costing them thousands of dollars. It was a difficult time for the members of Origin. The hibernation, however, gave them plenty of time to rebuild their momentum after the move. As Richard developed a vision for Ultima IV, it became clear that this was going to be a monumental task, more so than anything they'd ever done. The previous games took anywhere from weeks to months to, at the very most, a full year to complete. They established that Ultima IV would take no less than two full years to finish. This would have been an almost unprecedentedly long development cycle back in the early 80s, when sales were uncertain and developers were expected to constantly generate profit. This meant that Origin would have to find alternate revenue streams. I know what you're thinking, and no, the Nauseator was no longer on the table. In order to keep the operation afloat, a new member of Origin, Greg Malone, would develop a CRPG called Mobius, the Orb of Celestial Harmony. Having been developed almost entirely by Malone, the Ultima series DNA is nowhere to be found here. The game was an unorthodox blend of Chinese mythology and traditional RPG mechanics. One particularly standout mechanic was the game's karma system, which kept a simple tally on the player's deeds throughout the game a little uh, unintentional foreshadowing from Origin themselves. The gameplay was unique, the graphics were quite good for their time, and for the most part, critics praised the game. Origin would also work on expanding their existing operations. In one such venture, they would enter into a contract with Steve Jackson Games, whose namesake was actually a friend of Richard's from the Society of Creative Anachronism. Jackson was becoming a hot commodity at the time, with his complex tabletop games appealing to audiences outside the D&D niche. Richard would arrive to Steve Jackson headquarters for a meeting. Perhaps due to the cold and miserable circumstances of Massachusetts at the time, Richard was going through a bit of a rebellious period. He was often clad in black leather with jewelry dangling from his neck. A badder nerd there surely never was. An employee of Steve Jackson Games couldn't help but take notice of the young Garriott, thinking to himself, this guy is the personification of success. It wouldn't be the last time that this employee, a man in his late 20s by the name of Warren Spector, would cross paths with Lord British, but those are stories for another day. For now, Origin's contract with Steve Jackson would result in Auto Duel, an Apple II-based adaptation of the tabletop game Car Wars, developed by Chuckles. The game was an intricate, car-based CRPG. Gameplay would have the player complete different types of driving missions, earning money and parts to customize their vehicle. 
It's a deceptively complex and enduringly unique game. While the graphics and sound didn't do much to impress, the game was met with praise and surprisingly good sales. Auto Duel reportedly sold roughly as many copies as Ultima 3 had, an indicator that Origin's strategy of not just being the Ultima guys was probably a wise move. Behind the scenes, Origin had also arranged a contract with a PC game publisher whose popularity had been skyrocketing, Electronic Arts. What does this footage have to do with anything? Get that off the screen. EA had missed the boat on bringing Garriott in as a direct partner, but the two entities could still find ways to do business together. EA would help Origin with distribution channels, giving their games shelf space at major retailers like Sears and Toys R Us. This was a tremendous boon for Origin, abating some of the uncertainty surrounding Ultima 4's release. These various agreements and cash injections allowed Origin to maintain their rock-steady pace in Ultima 4's development. There'd be no rushing this time, no compromises, no boss breathing down their necks. Ultima 4 had to meet consumer expectations, as well as Garriott's, which were perhaps even more demanding. Up until the summer of 1983, Ultima's pathway had been obvious. Each subsequent game iterated on its predecessor in clear, mostly mechanical ways. With Akalabeth as its point of origin, every sequel would see the world expanding, the gameplay becoming more complex, and certain advancements such as music being implemented to improve the overall presentation. With Ultima 4, that once clear pathway was becoming convoluted. Still reeling from the angry letters and concerned parents, Garriott was determined to have Ultima 4 focus on morality rather than monster slaying, an unprecedented maneuver. While Richard couldn't resist taking on the artistic challenge, the business-minded Robert failed to see the appeal. He was very clear. Let people slay monsters and murder villagers. People don't play games for the story, Richard. Well, they may not have, but if everything worked out, they would. Yet, self-doubt would creep in. Garriott was admittedly not a particularly well-read person. When he started contemplating the moral and ethical systems used in some of his favorite works of fiction, he realized quickly that he was out of his depth. While he may not have been an expert, one of Richard's greatest assets was his ability to learn quickly and absorb information when he needed to. He developed a veritable library at which he'd obsessively be reading and taking notes. Aesop's fables, Greek and Roman philosophy, the Bible, the Quran, Hindu literature, and Buddhist texts, they all occupied shelf space and all were studied extensively. Yet none of the individual research materials seemed appropriate as the driving force of a video game story. Garriott combed through the notes he'd taken and began plucking out the truths that seemed universal, foundational, and more suited to his chosen medium. From there, those different philosophies and ideas were deconstructed, categorized, and systematically assembled into what would ultimately be known as the Eight Virtues. We'll talk more about this system in detail shortly. While looking into Hindu writings, Richard was struck by the idea of an avatar. In Sanskrit, avatar means descent, symbolizing the manifestation of a deity on Earth. This physical instantiation of the metaphysical would arrive when the righteous suffered, so that a deity might counteract evil while still abiding by the laws governing our universe. As a concept for the game, it was perfect. The main character of Ultima 4 would act as the player's self, not an alter ego or a distant simulacrum under the player's control, but a representation of the player's thoughts, actions, and goals. The phrase, my character, implies a degree of separation, like playing a character in a D&D game, for instance. You won't always act in accordance with your morals because you're meant to be playing somebody else, like, say, an evil summoner. The term avatar would imply that this character is a conduit through which the player presents themselves to a world wherein they are a visitor, not merely a person playing a game. The title for Ultima 4 was decided. Quest of the Avatar. In case it's not obvious, Garriott was taking this entry much more seriously than the previous three. In pursuit of a more grounded fantasy world, he removed many of the fantasy races, such as dwarves, elves, and bobbits. Speaking of bobbits, the overt references to Lord of the Rings were removed, as well as many of the pop culture trappings and science fiction wackiness. 
This would be the first Ultima to wholly exist as its own world. Roughly halfway into Ultima 4's development, Garriott concluded that he was going to need help. Of course, he always had help when it came to programming issues or converting tile graphics, but this time he would need help help. The game was far too big and far too ambitious for Richard to tackle it in a mostly solo capacity as he had with the previous games. One new hire was Steven Muse, who would help create an interface through which Ultima 4's world could be built. Prior to this, Garriott had been using a hex editor to place events and tiles. It left too much room for error and wasted time when code compilation wouldn't go as planned. It was difficult to relinquish complete control, but necessary for the sake of efficiency. Sometimes having a team working hand in hand opens you to new perspectives and makes your work better than it would have been otherwise. Roe R. Adams III is an enigmatic figure who appears frequently throughout this critical period of CRPG history. He was involved in the development of The Bard's Tale, Wizardry 4, The Return of Wardna, and now joined the team at Origin, helping to develop Ultima 4's scenario. These early days of CRPG history seemingly owe a great deal to Adams, though like so many people critical at the time, it's difficult to find much information about him. This also makes it difficult to precisely quantify his involvement in Ultima 4. Some testify that he was a critical figure in helping Garriott develop the virtues, while others say his role was that of a consultant. The back page of the instruction manual thanks Roe Adams for his invaluable collaboration on the plots of the great quests, as well as crediting him with the writing of an included gamebook. Adams was well respected in the space. He was reportedly very well read, a very clever writer, and a very shrewd gamer. Richard, by his own admission, wasn't much of a reader, wasn't a great speller, and didn't play many games outside of his own. With that in mind, there's no doubt that having someone like Adams in Origin's pocket would have been a significant help in the development of Ultima 4. It may be difficult to find a shred of information about this fellow online, but his work remains appreciated. It was 1985 and Origin was on track to release the game before Christmas. The hype surrounding Ultima 4 was building. Garriott had been promising many new and exciting features. A world that was 16 times the size of its predecessor, diverse parties of up to 16 monsters per encounter, and an intriguing new alchemy-based magic system. The player's party would be bigger, the dungeons would be more detailed, and the game would incorporate advanced mechanics like camping. If Origin could deliver on these promises, the industry would be in for another shakeup. Behind the scenes, Richard was becoming racked with anxiety towards the potential response to the game. Was Robert right? Was the total shift in priorities just too radical for Ultima's existing audience? Would Richard come across as a self-important preacher to others just as Ultima 3's detractors had seemed to him? As development reached its conclusion, Richard realized that Ultima 4's existence as a response to his moral critics was only incidental. While their angry letters may have planted the seed, Quest of the Avatar's primary purpose was to push the boundaries of an art form still in its infancy. As long as he believed that games could someday be taken seriously as literature or film, Ultima 4 had to come out, and for better or for worse, it had to make a statement. On September 16th, 1985, Ultima 4 Quest of the Avatar released on the Apple II, Commodore 64, and Atari 8-bit computer systems. Many of the differences and similarities I've gone over for previous games hold true here. The Apple II version is our base, and as you can see, looks an awful lot like Ultima 3, aside from some new tiles and character sprites. The Commodore 64 version, once again programmed by Chuckles, as well as the Atari 8-bit version, look almost identical to the Apple II version. The IBM PC version, released several months later, looked markedly better than any of the launch versions. This was thanks to the 16-color EGA graphics, which were rapidly becoming the new IBM standard. It was the first time that IBM's port was not inferior. There were also some ports released years later, such as the Amiga port, which, while looking similar to the IBM version, featured some noticeable improvements, such as the mouse-driven controls, which make interacting with the world much smoother. The dungeon graphics also look significantly better than the other versions. Now I know that I promised we'd talk about those other big ports last time, and we will, Slugger, I promise. We're almost at that point in the story of Origin, but we're not quite there yet. 
For now, these contemporary computer ports would be the extent to which Ultima would find its way onto other platforms. There have been various source ports made since then, and they might be a great option for new players. We'll once again be looking at the IBM version available on GOG, for free I might add. While the upgrade patch isn't required this time, since the graphics already took advantage of the EGA standard, a patch does still exist. It can extend the graphics far beyond the release standard, as well as adding music back into the game, a feature that was originally absent due to the lack of IBM sound cards on the market. Speaking of music, Ultima 4's soundtrack is a noticeable step up compared to Ultima 3. It was again composed by Ken Arnold, who was gaining greater understanding of the Mockingbird's capabilities. The songs maintain a medieval flavor, and the compositions themselves are fun and adventurous. Many of these tunes have gone down in Ultima history, so much so that they were used in Akalabeth's 1998 re-release. So we've fought Mondain, we've battled Minax, and we've slain Exodus. Each manifestation of evil has become more powerful than the last, presenting us with greater challenges. The question is, who's next? What manner of scoundrel threatens the stability of Britannia this time? The answer is no one. Ultima 4 opens in a manner not dissimilar from the adventure games being produced by Sierra Online. A scene is graphically depicted with vibrant detail, its nuances described in a text blurb. The day is warm, yet there is a cooling breeze. The latest in a series of personal crises seems insurmountable. You are being pulled apart in all directions. This now iconic opening would act as a dramatic shift in perspective for our main character. It's the modern era. We are not a lone hero or the leader of a group of adventurers. We're us, and we're exhausted. It's like magic. How did they know that I'm exhausted? As we lean back against a willow tree and close our tired eyes, an ethereal blue glow appears in the middle of a nearby stone circle. Through this portal drops several items of interest, including an onk, a cloth map, a book labeled The History of Britannia, as told by Kyle the Younger, and another book covered in arcane runes. The game tells us to read the Book of History. No, really, read the Book of History. On second glance, these items found by us in-game are literally the items that come with the game. In one of many examples of Ultima 4's meta-narrative, the actions of our character are meant to reflect those of the player. So the game asks us to crack open this 40-page book penned by Roe Adams and get reading. Chapter 1. Political History Jess, get my corncob pipe and set me a place by the fire. I've got reading to do. At the time, there were a lot of media personalities critical of video games. They're immoral, they make you stupid, etc. I wonder if any of those critics were ever prompted to open up a book of political history on Friday night before an episode of Dallas. Probably not. So, as instructed, I took a break from the game that I hadn't even really started playing yet and read through the history of Britannia as told by Mr. The Younger. This book is absolutely critical reading if you're going to understand and play through Ultima 4. It acts as a basic foundation for the story, your understanding of the game's world, as well as your goals within it. The first three games had very simple stories, but the Book of History adds additional context to the events of those games, as regaled to us by Yolo the Bard. Since the destruction of Exodus at the end of Ultima 3, the land has once again been at peace. Lord British, now confident that this time of prosperity will last, seeks to improve the lives of his subjects. He's established three institutions to further the ends of Britannians. A great observatory known as the Lyceum, a place of study and contemplation known as Empath Abbey, and the castle of the Knight's Order of the Silver Serpent. The remaining land was divided amongst the eight cities of Britannia, each with their own unique political structures and values. The Magi establish the town of Moonglow, the Bards mainly inhabit the town of Britain, the Venerable Fighters come from the town of Jalome, Druids congregate in the town of Yew, hidden deep within the woods. The Tinkerers hail from Minoc, preferring to work with their hands rather than relying on magic. The Formidable Paladins come from the town of Trinzic, the Woodland Rangers hail from the bucolic island town of Scarabray. Lastly, the humble and wise shepherds are associated with the once great city of Magincia, which due to its pride was destroyed by the gods. The world we once knew as Sosaria is no more. 
The defeat of Exodus caused a massive upheaval across the world, altering the very land itself. Many of the individual islands and continents of Caesarea became one, a land henceforth known as Britannia. At the center of Britannia is the castle of Lord British, standing tall and proud, its surrounding town of Britain being a hub of culture and the arts. While the world may generally be at peace, there are still dangers and mysteries across Caesarea, with evildoers taking advantage of helpless travelers. The amount of detailed lore packed into this book is astounding. It all lends to your immersion within the game world and gives you a sense that Britannia, while fictional, is a vast living world being taken seriously by its creator. That makes me want to take it seriously too. Questions you likely didn't even have are answered. The book details the minting of Britannia's coins and how they're almost impossible to counterfeit. Hell, it even explains that trade-in values on badly maintained gear are significantly less but still greater than zero because the material itself can be repurposed as scrap for the foundry. I've played through a lot of RPGs in my life and I've never stopped to ask, why is this blacksmith buying my busted-ass iron armor? Yet, Ultima 4 has the answers. I don't need to have all this information, but I need to have all this information. In a section marked Modern Civilization and Our Universe, the author of the manual poses many questions that exist at the heart of Ultima IV, and also represent the player's goal. Is living a life of virtue an essential element of civilization, or will society survive without common principles? How might we ensure the long-term continuation of this newfound peace? What systems of laws and ethics will ensure the continued happiness of the people? Can we achieve a solid foundation upon which to build a life of virtue? How can we face nature without first facing ourselves? You, an Ultima 3 player, let's say, are thinking to yourself, Listen pal, I'm here to vanquish malevolent entities and chew bubblegum, and I'm all out of gum. That's where you're wrong. See, you're actually out of malevolent entities. These philosophical questions, they're yours to answer, and the peace of Britannia hinges on you doing so. For you see, you are the Avatar, or at least you will be. After doing your homework, you'll be allowed to progress through the intro, and this is where the differences between Ultima 4 and its predecessors become truly apparent. Character creation in Ultima Exodus was a matter of naming yourself, choosing your sex, race, and class, then distributing attribute points. This is no longer the case in Ultima 4, which instead organically weaves its character creation in alongside the narrative. After finding these mysterious objects, we stumble across a renaissance fair seemingly in the middle of nowhere. Upon recognition of the Ankh, we're ushered into a caravan where a fortune teller sits us down in front of an abacus and begins to ask us questions. We're presented with scenarios and given a choice between two different outcomes. For example, during battle, thou art ordered to guard thy commander's empty tent. The battle goes poorly, and thou dost yearn to aid thy fellows. Dost thou a. valiantly enter the battle to aid thy companions, or b. honor thy post as a guard? Your selections indicate which virtue you value more highly, valor or honor. Your selection is recorded, and the questions continue until you've chosen a particular principle as the one you value most highly. This is our introduction to the eight virtues, whose presence will be felt throughout the entire game. You'll be assigned a class depending on the virtue you value most. For example, my avatar chose Valor and thus became a fighter. But you can end up with any of the eight classes associated with the eight towns of Britannia. This idea of taking disparate game elements such as the character creation system and the eight virtues themselves and finding creative ways to join them holistically is unique to Ultima 4 and something that the game is far from finished exploring. In some sense, it's intimidating to relinquish control over the situation. Like our protagonist, one moment at a renaissance fair and the next whisked off to Britannia, we're a fish out of water. Your class, your attributes, even your starting location, all of these aspects are now out of your hands. Your only edict is the same one given since Akalabeth. Find Lord British. The fighter begins in Jalom, which is located on an island. How do I reach the mainland where Lord British is? Is there a boat? A portal? Well, the bad news is that I walked through a poison swamp, and now I'm dying. The good news is that there is no dying, you're brought back to life right in front of Lord British, which is an embarrassing introduction, but a stroke of fortune nonetheless. After scolding you for dying within minutes of starting the game, Lord British welcomes you to Britannia and tells you that a new age is upon the world, 
The people, now idle and purposeless, need a champion to lead them to a brighter future by mastering virtue. And you're off. Ultima 4 is one of the most non-linear RPGs ever made. You're given non-specific directions and sent on your way to make it happen, whatever it is. In this case, that it is mastering the eight virtues. Compassion, honesty, valor, honor, sacrifice, justice, spirituality, and humility. This ambiguity is partially why the Book of History is such an indispensable resource. It's here you'll learn that each town is associated with one of the virtues. My fighter's hometown of Jalome is obviously related to Valor since that was my chosen virtue during the opening. A fresh new addition to Ultima 4 which prevents you from becoming utterly lost is the conversation mechanic. In previous Ultima games, you'd press the Transact button, point in the direction of an NPC, and receive either a generic piece of dialogue or, if you were lucky, a vague hint about where something might be. Ultima 4 is quite different. After beginning a conversation, you're prompted to type out a topic of discussion. This could be someone's name or occupation, of which the majority of NPCs actually have unique answers. Some, such as Lord British, will provide you with direction when you type the word help. Others will have special bits of dialogue only available if you already know the unique keyword to ask them about. One of the defining aspects of this conversation system, and a reason it works so well, is how clever Ultima 4 is in goading you into asking the right questions. Ask this guard about his job and he'll tell you, I guard the bridge. Ask about the bridge and he'll respond with, across the bridge our people dance and sing. Then he'll prompt you with a question, would thou like to join them? If you answer no, the conversation is terminated and the bridge guard is sad. You sick son of a bitch. If you answer yes, he'll respond with, Remember, an open heart is the first step on the path of wisdom. Each topic discussed by an NPC will give you another topic hidden within the sentence, often allowing you to prod them for more information and resulting in them asking you a question. You know, like an actual conversation. In reality, the text parser used by Ultima 4 only reads the first four letters of your query, and once you know how those keywords work, you'll only stick to a small handful of them. It might seem a little rudimentary, and admittedly the complexity and number of conversation options isn't going to blow minds these days, but this system was a huge leap forward, and it still works surprisingly well. You can glean relevant information about your quest if you're shrewd and choose the right topic, making conversations feel like a miniature puzzle. You'll have to memorize or write down the names of people and institutions mentioned in conversations. Some townsfolk will perhaps tell you about a particular mage in another town, or a pub owner who might have some tea to spill. It's the first major change you'll notice, and it affects the game in a lot of ways. The goal here was making Ultima 4 feel like a world that existed with or without the player's participation. NPCs have names, jobs, and goals of their own. While the technology wasn't nearly advanced enough to facilitate the living, breathing world that Garriott envisioned, this was the first clear step in that direction. Still, you might find yourself wondering how exactly to master these eight virtues and progress the story. But that's precisely the kind of attitude that Lord British doesn't want you to approach the quest with. Underneath the seemingly mundane goings-on of Britannia, there's a system of morality in place that watches your every movement. The computer itself acts as a big brother, gathering information on the kind of person you are and judging your mastery of the virtues. By performing certain actions such as giving money to a beggar, completing tasks, and responding to others in conversations, your various virtue scores will go up or down. I hesitate to even call them scores since it's so antithetical to the core principles of Ultima 4, but literally speaking, that's what they are, variables. Returning to Castle Britannia, you can speak to the seer Hawkwind, based on the D&D character of Roe Adams. If you can make it through his room, which is inexplicably filled with mystical knockout gas that makes you fall asleep, he'll tell you how well you're measuring up in each of the eight virtues. I guess it kinda looks like incense in other versions of the game. While players will inevitably discover that their behavior is being monitored, that's not the important thing. As long as the player doesn't know when they're being watched, the natural consequence is that they'll act morally. Garriott grew up in an interfaith home of sorts, being forced to go to Sunday school. Though he doesn't consider himself to be religious, there was value to be extracted from these experiences. His Sunday school teachers would focus on different moral and ethical teachings within the stories, treating them like parables and provoking thoughtful discussion. 
It's interesting then that despite Richard's inclination towards the more philosophical ends of religion, the god in the machine is omnipresent in Ultima 4, not threatening the player with eternal damnation but the inability to finish the game. Yet this was an effective motivator, and in acting out of fear, the player will inevitably reflect on their own actions as well. Without being sent on a quest to pursue a nefarious villain, the game would act as an exploration of the self, the recognition of one's vice, and the pursuit of virtue. The motivation for all actions would have to be intrinsic, and this assumes the very best of Ultima's players. Until recently, those players would be all too happy to steal a crop duster to progress the story, or slaughter an entire village of clerics for money. I mean, look, what the hell was I supposed to do? Ultima 4 instead asks you questions. What would you do, not your character, but you do in this situation? Surely even the most misanthropic among us would have the good sense to not kill an entire town of people, right? Right? There was a sacrifice here in the sense of role-playing. The Age of Darkness trilogy had closely matched principles of a classic D&D campaign. You create your character, and they are who you want them to be. That person often inevitably became someone who cruises around in land speeders, shooting jesters in the head with ray guns, but still. In Ultima 4, you were no longer given the same sense of freedom in role-playing. Your name and sex are the only traits you're directly asked to influence. You are the Avatar, and while you can choose to act out of line with the Avatar's values, doing so will not only make the game difficult to complete, but quite impossible. Part of maturing means choosing a path. This entails practicing the virtue of sacrifice and eliminating countless other possibilities. With Quest of the Avatar, Ultima had taken a major step towards maturity. This placing of the player in the shoes of a specific kind of person and offering freedom within that framework would largely be adhered to for the remainder of the Ultima series. Arresting the control of the game from the player was Garriott's way of conquering what he considered to be a growing problem among his player base, min-maxing. No, not cosplaying as the villain from Ultima 2, but playing the game with the specific goal of becoming as powerful as possible. Dispelling altogether with immersion, role-playing, or personal reflection, many players would simply find ways to exploit the game in order to maximize their stats and find the best equipment. This would sometimes even include assassinating Lord British himself as a flex, or his body double, Lord Britishes. This aggression will not stand, decided Garriott, who felt that this min-maxing was antithetical to the potential strengths of an RPG. Therefore, Ultima 4 was designed to eliminate the need for, or ability to engage in, min-maxing. Part of this was the non-linearity. There's no clear optimal progress route due to how large Britannia actually is and the sheer number of options you have when starting the game. Another anti-min-maxing mechanic would be character creation. Well, yes, once you know which virtue is associated with which class, you can game the system pretty easily. But when you first boot up the game, you'll be given a role to play depending on your values, and you won't have much of a say in it. Finally, there's the morality system itself. As mentioned, it becomes obvious that your actions are being recorded, but not which actions. This means that you'll always be acting in sensible ways, never killing without cause, never stealing, being courteous. You'll often be asked questions by inquisitive NPCs. Years of RPG training might have you tempted to answer questions in the affirmative, knowing that you might get a cool weapon or gold if an NPC likes you. But your dishonesty will not be forgotten, so skip through conversations at your own peril. Nowadays, with data mining tools, it's impossible to obfuscate meaningful information from the player. And that's a damn shame. Case in point, Ultima 4, where the game's systems, until recently, could only be understood from a surface level, giving the game a critical sense of mystery and encouraging the player to act in accordance with the virtues. However, the reality is that there are specific actions one can take to exercise the virtues. Let's take a closer look at the virtues, what they mean, how they overlap, and how they're best pursued in Britannia. Compassion is associated with the town of Britain and the class of the Bard. Compassion is best shown by giving money to beggars and perhaps a bit more obtusely fleeing from battle with non-evil creatures. Of course, how would you know that the giant poisonous rats, bats, and spiders are non-evil and to avoid them? Well, I can't deny that there are hints. First of all, if you pay attention, you'll notice that their movement on the overworld is random while evil creatures move towards the party. The manual also tells you to treat pythons with respect. 
as though they'll do the same for you, various characters in the game will tell you to avoid killing non-evil creatures, probably a day late and a dollar short. When you kill non-evil creatures, you become less compassionate. And let me tell you, you lose virtue a hell of a lot faster than you gain it. Despite the hints, the loss of compassion in this way can be pretty punishing. Honesty relates to the town of Moonglow, home of the mage class. Honesty is maintained simply by being honest, not cheating others. A store owner in Moonglow is blind, so if you're a truly deranged individual, you can give her the incorrect amount of gold for her wares. Yet stealing and lying are dishonest acts, so even when you're cheating the blind or alone in a room with some juicy treasure chests, the big guy is watching and he sees your soul and it's not looking good. Valor is another virtue, that is, maintaining one's courage in the face of danger exhibited by the fighters of Jalome. Valor is earned slowly but steadily, simply by standing toe to toe with evil enemies, but lost quickly by fleeing. While Ultima 4 is a significantly less grindy game than its predecessors, you're heavily discouraged from running from enemies in this way, which can be fatiguing by the end of the game. The virtue of justice is the practice of fairness in all things, valued greatly by the druids of you. Allowing wounded, non-evil enemies to flee and practicing honesty is what makes one just. Stealing from, cheating, and attacking others will make one unjust indeed. There's a child running in fear of a bull in one of the game's towns, so I thought I was being helpful by killing the bull. Let me tell you, this bull might as well be the statue of Babe the Big Blue Ox in Brainerd, because the townsfolk will see you skinned alive if you kill it, and no self-defense allowed here either. Sacrifice, a virtue practiced by the tinkerers of Minoc, is the giving of one's very self. Being slain in battle to protect one's comrades or giving blood to the healer will reinforce sacrifice. Fleeing like a coward or refusing to help the healer will result in a self-serving heart. Honor is respecting the absolute highest standards of conduct and is codified by the paladins of Trinzic. Helping townspeople with their problems and speaking honestly will help develop one's sense of honor. Stealing and attacking non-evil creatures are considered to be dishonorable acts. Humility is acting in modesty and not being braggadocious. Valued by the few shepherds left in Magincia, humility is cultivated by never being boastful in conversation, and the inverse, of course, is true as well. If you're a people pleaser, you might mistakenly try to make yourself look good in a conversation, but you'll only be hurting yourself. Finally, there's spirituality, a virtue held in high esteem by the rangers of Scarabray. Spirituality represents unwavering faith in the goodness of all other virtues for its own sake, and thus understanding the nature of enlightenment. Greater spirituality can only be achieved through repeated meditation and reflecting on the virtues with Hawkwind the Seer. The eight virtues all emanate from three principles, truth, love, and courage. Justice comes from both truth and love. This is because it requires both impartiality, truth, and empathy, love. Equal and opposite punishments, such as the removal of one's tongue for the crime of lying, are not only cruel, but fail to teach lessons from which one can reflect and grow. Truth without love cultivates only bitterness. Compassion comes from love, honor comes from truth and courage, spirituality comes from truth, love, and courage. Each virtue represents a different combination of the three, with the exception of humility. More on that later. In addition, each virtue has an equal and opposite vice. Deceit correlates with honesty, shame with honor, and so on and so forth. Thus, the virtues are part of an entire system, which is surprisingly intricate. The more Garriott thought through this virtue system, the more correlations he found to ancient philosophy and even pop culture. The three main characters from The Wizard of Oz are a classic example. The Tin Man in Search of a Heart represents love, the Scarecrow in Need of a Brain represents truth, the Cowardly Lion, of course, represents courage. As his system was a pastiche of existing philosophical ideas, Garriott was far from the first person to arrive at many of these conclusions. Yet, the fact that he did arrive at many of the same conclusions of writers who developed their own ethical systems for fiction seemed to indicate that he was on the right track. Now, there are two distinct ways to view the virtues of Ultima IV, the first being the intended way. If you play through Ultima 4 this way, you'll likely have little problem with the game's handling of the virtues. 
as you travel across Britannia, exploring dungeons, battling enemies, speaking to townsfolk, and investigating secrets, you'll cultivate the virtues as a consequence of just interacting with the world as you normally would. You'll check in with Hawkwind now and then, he'll tell you if you're on the right track, or if you're an irredeemable scumbag as you've been killing too many spiders, and you'll head out and adventure some more, no particular goal in mind. That thing about spiders? Well, it's a joke, but there is a grain of truth in there. Some innocuous sounding conversation options can have devastating effects on your virtue, a consequence of Ultima 4 being the first of its kind. The second lens for understanding virtues is a mechanical one. Once you understand the virtues in their most literal form, you'll find that Ultima 4 doesn't live up to the promise of its moral system. See, the only way to gain in certain virtues and thus progress the game is by repeatedly performing extremely specific tasks. Sacrifice, for example, essentially requires you to give blood over and over and over again, and you don't even get a donut after. Compassion is chiefly gained by giving beggars money every time you see them. If you need to become compassionate quickly, you can just make it rain on those beggars. The game tries to create some stoppage by only allowing you to gain virtue from any given beggar once per visit to the city, but you'll probably figure this out quickly. Once you know what works and what doesn't, exercising the virtues feels somewhat performative. Like a YouTuber giving a homeless person money on camera, it's not the goodness of your heart that's driving the action, but a desire to be recognized for it. In this way, Ultima 4 doesn't quite escape from the min-maxing mindset it tries so hard to shirk itself of. Gaining mastery over a virtue doesn't always feel like enlightenment so much as it does exploiting the system, since there are so few direct actions that influence them. Certain virtues do better in this regard, such as honor, which has more specific activities associated with it. For example, the town of Jalome is surrounded by a wall. Searching the nearby inn will reveal a secret entrance to the inner wall. If you keep following this path, you'll come across somebody who's been trapped inside of it. After talking with them, they'll follow you back outside of the wall. The game systems aren't advanced enough to allow for scripted segments or dialogue triggered once they're out, but simply helping them boosts your honor. Humility is another virtue that's ambiguous enough that it can apply to many of the game's conversations. You can find one conversation that boosts humility and just continually engage in it, but it's totally possible to just gain it by exploring. For the most part though, there are only a small handful of situations that test the durability of your morals. It's easy to see this now in hindsight. We've had decades of video games developing and iterating on moral systems, some better than others. As a first step in a new direction though, Ultima's focus on being good over beating bad was nothing short of groundbreaking, a proof of concept for the cerebral future awaiting the RPG genre. Aside from these specific instances, the goal of Ultima 4, broadly speaking, is simply to adventure. Despite the more intellectual subject matter, it feels like a lower stakes game than any of its predecessors. Unlike those games set in the Age of Darkness, there's no omnipresent evil to pressure you throughout your journey. It feels like things are just under control. Lord British is a good ruler, the people are happy. It's almost leisurely, or dare I say, comfy. The feeling of adventure is fantastic, and that all begins with the world of Britannia. This game is much bigger and also more detailed than any of the previous Ultimas. Whereas the map in Exodus felt relatively small and video gamey, Ultima 4's map feels huge by comparison, and as an environment, it's also far more convincing. There are forests, swamps, rivers, hills, and mountains blending into each other and creating distinctive, recognizable sections of the map. Your vision is now only affected in Britannia's darkest forests, and your character's speed is reduced on harsher terrain. Depending on your starting town, even reaching Britain, where the de facto quest begins, can be quite a trial by fire. Like Ultima 3, enemy icons will spawn into the overworld, and making contact with them will send you into a separate battle screen. Until you have your bearings, they're best avoided, though this isn't always possible, as they have a terrain advantage. Because of this more natural layout, traveling across Britannia isn't always convenient. Since, you know, traveling in real life isn't always convenient. Many impassable tiles will require significant detours, and a lack of river running through Britannia's center will force even those with a vessel to circumvent the continent in its entirety. In the beginning, especially before you have access to those ships, many of the islands dotting the ocean will be altogether unreachable. However, thanks to moon gates, you can quickly travel to the farthest reaches of Britannia, once you understand how they work. 
There's a moon gate near each of the eight major towns, which themselves correspond to one of eight moon phases. Like in Ultima 3, you'll see a representation of the phases of Britannia's twin moons, Tremel and Felucha. Tremel's phase affects when a moon gate will appear, and Felucha's phase affects where that gate will take you. Britain, for instance, is represented by the crescent waxing phase, while U is represented by a gibbous waxing moon. If you wait for a gibbous waxing Tremel near you, a moon gate will appear. If you step through it while Felucha is in its crescent waxing phase, you'll appear near Britain. If you wait just a little bit too long to step through and Fallujah's phase advances to a first quarter, you'll instead appear near Jalome, since that town is represented by the first quarter phase. You're given a hint at how these moon gates work on the cloth map included with Ultima 4, which itself is of higher quality and greater navigational use than ever. Striving for realism is often dangerous territory for a designer, since fun and realistic are sometimes mutually exclusive. As with Exodus, I think the moon gates are a very clever solution to the potential tedium of walking back and forth between towns while maintaining the epic scale of the world. Understanding how they work is intuitive, but only if you're paying close attention. If you just blindly walk around looking for moon gates and step through them without carefully examining your circumstances, their appearance and your destination will just feel random. It's also on page 15 of the manual. Heed the words of Kyle if you wish to survive in this cruel world. Speaking of survival, well, I think the manual says it best. Little is worse than being far from a town and finding thyself and one's companions starving to death because the person in charge of the expedition, thou, hast forgotten to buy enough food. Hey, I resemble that remark. Food continues to be a factor in Ultima. If you run out, your party will begin to take light damage from starvation with each step taken. The rate of depletion is very slow though, so as long as you're halfway paying attention, you'll probably be alright. Food is gasoline for the journey, and I actually really enjoy having to make pit stops to top up my characters. It makes it feel like a road trip, and I love road trips. It really lends to this idea that you're on an actual pilgrimage. In so many cases throughout the first three games, there'd be towns, towns everywhere, but no reason to visit most of them. In Ultima 4, on top of requiring resources like food, you can also camp outside or rest at inns to replenish your health. Camping is free, but there's no guarantee that it'll restore much health. You'll also find yourself accosted by enemy parties outdoors. Inns cost money, but are guaranteed to restore some health. This also depends on the kind of inn you visit. Cheaper inns with less beds will result in less restored health, while more expensive inns found in some towns will restore more. If one of your party members is dead, however, you'll need to visit a healer for resurrection, which isn't cheap, mind you. You can also be accosted by bandits at some of the cheaper inns as well. If the innkeeper says that you're going to hear rats in the walls at night, you're definitely going to have your throat slit before morning. Inns host taverns, which sell food, albeit at a much steeper price than a grocer, but if needs must, it's a good option. In order to sleep at an inn, you must press Y for yes while at the front counter. I always pressed Y a few too many times while trying to speed my way through the conversation. Incidentally, Y is also the yell key, so my avatar woke up screaming almost every single morning. He's been through a lot. The presence of camping and inns, as well as the fun little variables that affect them, are a welcome addition to Ultima. It's nice to have reasons to visit these towns, as often you'll engage in conversations with locals who have tips that you might have overlooked when you last spoke to them. There's more reason than just inns and even the pursuit of virtues to visit the different towns. The various regions of Britannia have different economic focuses, and that's reflected in both the stock available at certain shops as well as the price of different goods. Towns that are more difficult to reach, such as the Buccaneer's Den, will have especially high quality and expensive equipment available. A town whose associated class focuses on magic will also have a reagent shop, which represents another critical difference in Ultima 4. In Ultima 3, any magic or cleric class could technically cast any of their respective skills at level 1. They were only limited by the amount of MP they had. Ultima 4 has undergone some major changes in the magic department. Now, on top of requiring enough MP to cast a spell, you also need to create spells in order to cast them in the first place. Reagent shops are located throughout Britannia, each one selling a different assortment of alchemical ingredients at different prices. As a brief aside, I just love the subtle attention paid to economy here. 
Black pearls are one of the most expensive ingredients in every shop, except the Buccaneer's Den, presumably because of its proximity to the ocean where the pearls are harvested. Things like this show that they really just give a damn about making the world feel like a world. In any case, these reagents are used in combination with one another to create spells, which themselves are consumed upon use. A basic spell like Cure, which is used to heal poison, requires one bulb of garlic and one ginseng root. More powerful offensive skills require more and rarer ingredients, such as the spell Ice Ball, which requires a black pearl and the elusive mandrake root. Like Ultima 3, Ultima 4 comes with a spellbook, this time adorned with mystic runes signifying the arcane knowledge contained within. It's filled with awesome descriptions of the in-world mechanics of magic, each reagent, as well as the spells themselves, accompanied by these great comic book style illustrations. It's more than just flavor text though, the descriptions of the reagents will often provide you with subtle clues as to their use. This is important since you'll likely only figure out some of the correct combinations by experimenting. As long as you have the right ingredients, you can pack as many reagents into the mixture as you want, so you can discover new spells via process of elimination. However, that's not very economical. It's better to heed the clues in the manual and talk to the various wizards within Britannia who can show you how to mix those spells. In practice, the system's interface can be annoying. In order to make a bunch of cure or heal spells, and you'll need a bunch, you'll be banging out the same key commands dozens of times per session. The option to create larger amounts at once would have been appreciated. Shops allow you to purchase any number of weapons you want at one time, so it's not like the game was programmatically incapable of this. There are many things about Quest of the Avatar that are streamlined. Character creation, for example. The reagent system is a nice way of reintroducing complexity back into the game in a totally different area. However, it also points to one of Ultima 4's biggest problems. As cool as this magic system is, you'll notice before long that both mages and clerics share one unified spellbook this time. In Ultima 3, there was a clear delineation between these classes. The different spell categories would sometimes share principles, but they both felt unique enough to justify having a wizard and a cleric in the party. This consolidation of the magic system is one example of how classes have been made to feel less unique than in Exodus. The ability to cast spells was one of the major defining features of each class in that game. The fact that Ultima 4 allows nearly every single class to cast spells from the same list results in class homogeneity. The druid doesn't feel like a commander of mother nature, she feels like a wizard with slightly less MP. In a way, the structure of the game demands this outcome. Since you can begin the game as any class, including, god forbid, the nigh-useless shepherd, most classes need to exist at similar power levels. It's too bad though, even Ultima 1 had different spells for clerics and wizards. Ultima 4's character building and the recruitment of new party members feels like a routine that never invites variety on subsequent playthroughs. Speaking of new party members, this is a major change from Exodus as well. As opposed to building your team of four from the beginning, you begin Ultima 4 alone and have to actively search for new compatriots as you explore. I guess busking doesn't pay the bills in Britain, since all I did was yell the word join, and Yolo was like, sounds good, but not before teaching the nearby children Britannia's national anthem. Oh, yo, he hum. Your maximum party size is equal to your character level, capping at eight, which is kind of a clever idea. It's like in order to become a more magnetic individual, you have to first build skill and renown through your journey. It also means you have to pick your initial companions wisely, because it takes exponentially more experience points to gain levels. These companions will become mainstays throughout Ultima, and each one is based on a real-life friend or associate of Richard Garriott's. Yolo the Bard is based on Garriott's friend, David Watson, who is an actual boyer. In the Society for Creative Anachronism, Watson took on the name Yolo Fitzowen, and it just stuck. Mariah the Mage is based on Michelle Cadell, who was Richard's secretary at Origin at the time. Then there's Jeffrey the Fighter, whose real-life counterpart is Jeff Hillhouse, an original member of the Origin team. Incidentally, the party member whose class matches your own can't join you, so Jeffrey has to sit this adventure out. Jaina the Druidess is based on Richard's friend of the same name, 
Julia the Tinkerer is based on a woman who Garriott was dating during the development of Ultima 4. Katrina the Shepherdess is based on Garriott's friend Kathy. Dupre the Paladin's counterpart is Greg Dykes, who, like Yolo, would act as Dupre in the Society for Creative Anachronism. Speaking of SCA, we finally have Shamino, Richard's alter ego who appears in Ultima 4 as a ranger. Of course he chose the thing that Aragorn is. Many of these different personas had appeared in earlier Ultima games, usually as named NPCs who'd offer hints or other bits of dialogue. Here, for the first time, and not the last, they represent the Avatar's comrades, supplanting the player-created team members of Ultima 3. Of course, being such an early example of an RPG with pre-made companions, the interactions here are rather primitive. As long as you can find them, and you're at the appropriate level, they'll join you. From there, you'll have to let your imagination do the heavy lifting, as they have no unique dialogue or actions to speak of. Still, having named companions with their own preordained professions along for the ride makes Ultima 4 feel like more of a Taylor adventure. This change from Ultima 3 to 4 resembles the changes made from Final Fantasy 3 to 4. In both cases, a more freeform, modular game system is pared down to facilitate greater narrative depth. The existence of these characters as not simply tools to help beat the game, but agents in their own world, inject some personality into Ultima 4. Thankfully, the party interface from Ultima 3 has been reworked, and if you ask me, this is a very positive example of streamlining. In Exodus, every action from talking to someone to purchasing equipment had to be preceded by selecting the party member who would perform that action. Not only that, but each party member had their own inventory, their own food supply, their own gold. This made the simple act of buying something into an event where you had to individually check everyone's inventory, and don't even get me started on moving items from one character to another. This whole cumbersome system has been completely done away with in Ultima 4. Now food, gold, equipment, and reagents are all shared in a single inventory. Actions are performed by the Avatar alone, lessening the amount of wasted time. I can't imagine working with eight party members using Ultima 3's system. Now, recruiting party members is a necessity here, not only because advancing the story requires it, but because there are plenty of enemies out for your blood. Combat is, at its core, very similar to Ultima 3, although it has been expanded upon. For one thing, enemy teams can now be mixed and matched rather than being comprised of just one unit type as they were before. This will somewhat change how you approach fights, as some enemies will move to your melee range while others can fire projectiles at you. There's also a greater diversity of those enemies, better animations, while well, they move a little fast depending on your CPU cycle speed, and better arenas too. Exodus introduced the idea of having the combat arena reflect the overworld tile where the fight was initiated. There's plenty more of these individual arenas in Ultima 4, and unlike the previous game, their layouts actually affect how the battle unfolds. If you encounter an enemy traveling through the hills, you'll be in a busy, obstacle-ridden arena, forcing you to move around rocks or risk having your ranged attacks stopped before they reach a target. If you run into some trolls on a bridge, well, you fight on a bridge. Forests, plains, seaside, even ship-to-ship -ship battles are represented here in all of their glory. Once again, character turns are dictated by their order in the menu, which can be changed, so fight strategy is quite predictable for the most part. Your best bet is to equip every party member with a ranged weapon. At the very least, every class is capable of wielding a sling, with most being able to use bows or crossbows. Even though slings aren't as powerful as maces, axes, or swords, the range more than makes up for the damage deficiency, often allowing you to take multiple shots at an enemy before they even approach you. Enemies are prone to fleeing in Ultima 4. If they take enough damage, they'll start moving towards the nearest edge of the map, and if they make it without dying, they'll escape. You'll still receive gold after the battle, as long as the traps in the chest don't kill you first. They all have traps, they always have traps. But if an enemy flees, you'll forfeit the experience points, which you'll definitely want. Experience can be cashed into Lord British for level ups, improving HP and random stats, and they become harder to acquire as the game goes on. So in order to prevent enemies from fleeing and allowing your character to get some free shots in, the combat meta here is ranged weapons. I gave the Avatar a sword for most of the game out of sheer defiance, but he started lagging behind the other party members in levels, so I felt like I had to give in. 
It's another example of this lack of class diversity, not to mention the Thief, which was able to disarm traps more effectively in Ultima 3, is no longer an option, and disarming isn't an active mechanic either. Of course, playing as a thief in a game where stealing prevents you from beating the game would be counterproductive, but it's too bad no unique class features were added. Hindsight is 2020, and Origins resources were limited, but the fact remains. Classes and character progression are Ultima 4's weaknesses. You're actively punished for using a melee weapon, and this makes many a battle into a trite matter of aiming up and firing, aiming up and firing. It feels like a lateral move from Ultima 3 as opposed to a clear step forward. Although it's a good idea to defeat as many enemies as possible for experience, you can purchase a horse to outrun enemies on the world map. Initially, it'll seem like a waste of money, but you'll find that in order to make it go faster, you have to press Y to yell, giddy up, and then you'll move two spaces instead of one. That's silly, I like it a lot. So you've mastered the virtues. You've given money to the poor, you've helped the downtrodden, you've donated blood even though you were drinking ayahuasca with the druids and you the other day. This is pre-regulation Britannia. You don't smell like an avatar, you don't dress like an avatar, and you certainly aren't surrounded by an ethereal glow like an avatar. So what gives? Well, it turns out that mastering the virtues is only one component of the avatar's quest. In order to become enlightened in the virtues, one must find all eight runes associated with them, learn their mantra, then meditate on those virtues at a shrine. Hey, nobody said that the quest of the Avatar would be simple. As a matter of fact, the back of the box tells you that you're facing impossible odds. See? So first come the eight runes. If one hopes to be given the honor of approaching a shrine, these artifacts are required. At this point, the game begins to feel like a mixture of Ultima and a Sierra adventure game. The runes could pretty much be anywhere, so putting your charm to work and following leads from the locals is key here. Speaking to Gimbal in the town of Minoc, he'll point you in the direction of Azure. Azure, when asked about the rune, will ask you which rune you mean. Well, we're in Minoc, the town of Sacrifice, so how about the rune of Sacrifice? At this point, you'll be told to seek a woman named Mischief. She can be found at the southwestern periphery of town, slightly hidden, but you'll find her if you're looking for her. She then tells you that the Rune of Sacrifice is hidden within the fires of the forge. So, heading to the town blacksmith, you have to brave the flames of the forge and use the S key to search its tiles until at last you stumble across the Rune of Sacrifice. What's interesting is that finding runes is fairly uneventful, but often requires a monumental effort. The hints you're given are often vague to begin with, such as, It's not in Scara Bray. Gee, Mike, that really narrows it down. Slowly, you'll deduce the location of a rune, usually through a combination of bringing up the right subjects to the right people and playing some hide-and-seek. As long as you keep notes, which I'd highly recommend, hunting for the rune is actually a fun little diversion that doesn't become frustrating. One of my favorite rune puzzles is in the town of Magincia. The townsfolk had been prideful for too long, and so the gods smote Magincia along with almost all of its citizens. It's grim to be sure, but on the other hand, Magincia is now the world's only four-season Spirit Halloween, so that's fun. The townsfolk are ghosts and skeletons and don't seem to be too hard done by it. Take no pride in humility, lest ye destroy it. Slim, that lesson would have best been learned before your flesh was vaporized, but better late than never, I always say. Well said, my friend. In the town of Magincia, you'll be chased by a snake. At this point in the game, you'll know that snakes are non-evil creatures, so you'll flee from battle, which erases the snake from the map. However, a ghost named Ruskin will give you a hint when asked about the rune. Ask the snake of the rune just before it strikes. So you lure Nate the snake over to you, but just before the battle begins, talk to Nate, who then tells you to speak to Baron in the town of Paws about the rune. Heading there, Baron will point you to the southeast corner of town where you'll find the rune. Simple, perhaps, but I really like how it uses Ultima's existing game systems in a creative way. It never would have occurred to me to try talking to a seemingly hostile entity. In addition to the runes themselves, you'll also have to track down the mantras associated with them. Like the runes, this requires you to talk to the citizens of Britannia. Unlike the runes, the mantras are directly acquired from the NPCs themselves. That is to say, if you have the mantras written down from a previous playthrough, you don't need to go hunting for them all, you already know them. 
A character named Cromwell, for instance, reveals that the mantra of the Shrine of Honesty is Om. Simple enough. Others take more detective work. A bard by the name of Sing Song will sing you a song. The raven sing, the raven saw, and in the corn he saith ka. What the hell is this song about? I have no idea. Sing Song lives in Minoc, the town of sacrifice. Ka, then, is the mantra of sacrifice. Druids in the woods, deep in a trance, will refuse to engage with you, though they do mumble the sound ba, which by now should set off some phonetic alarm bells in your head. I enjoy stringing together these context clues in order to figure out the mantras. Once you have the associated rune, you can hunt down the shrine which is often but not always located in the general vicinity of the town. Once there, you must correctly state the virtue upon which you're meditating, as well as repeat the mantra three times. You're actually intended to sit there and meditate on the virtue, as the game forces you to wait in between mantras. Incorrectly stating the virtue or the mantra will damage your spirituality. You might think, I'm already partial avatar, what are they gonna do, take my partial avatarhood away from me? Yep, that's exactly what they'll do. After achieving so-called enlightenment and sacrifice, I rested on my laurels a little bit too much and refused to give blood when asked. Oh, come on, I was all blooded out. I had to go to a thing. You guys need to get donuts. Next thing I knew, I was no longer partial avatar anymore. The same can happen if you get tired of fighting and start fleeing from battle. You'll lose valor. Once again, it's much easier to lose virtue than gain it. For this reason, it's actually a good idea to wait until you've collected all the materials and begin approaching the endgame before you get serious about the virtues. It's not exactly fun having to start from scratch, giving charity again, meditating at the shrine again, but it's an important lesson. There is no finish line, and the road to understanding is everlasting. The moment you believe yourself infallible, vice has already won. So enjoy your sweet, sweet cowardice while you can. Once you commit to valor, you'll want to stay committed. In addition to enlightenment, it's also a good idea to wait a while before you recruit every companion. There's sort of a level scaling implemented in order to make the game less ruthless for newer players. The types of enemies that appear are linked to the number of steps you've taken in-game, and enemy party size directly correlates with the size of your own party. You might think that having eight people with you will make fights a breeze, but it actually makes them longer and more complicated. Having to individually move eight characters and deal with such huge enemy parties can be exhausting when there are so many battles throughout the game. Prior to understanding Moon Gates, ocean travel will be a preferable method of getting from one end of the world to another. Some islands and secrets can also only be reached via boat. The ocean expanse is so vast and seemingly endless that it's real easy to lose your bearings. After being told to do so by several citizens, bringing up sextants at a tavern gives you a major clue. Ask for D at the guild shop. Since evil has been vanquished in Britannia, the Thieves' Guild was driven from the mainland, forced to secretly establish themselves in the middle of the sea. Even reaching the Buccaneer's Den can be a challenge, but you'll find the Thieves' Guild hidden in the back of its tavern. There, you ask for D? Oh, I get it. A, B, C, hidden option. Anyway, it's a sextant, and it's an incredibly helpful tool in getting your bearings, showing you your current latitude and longitude when used. One major use for the sextant is finding the Shrine of Humility, which is located on the Isle of the Stygian Abyss and guarded by endless hordes of demons. I mean endless like endless breadsticks. Technically, there's an end, but you'll be dead from old age long before you see it. Every square you move results in battle after battle after battle. These fights all take place in that particularly annoying mountain battle arena where you have to meander around rocks in order to hit the enemies. All of my teammates waiting in line like we're at the DMV getting our licenses renewed. The worst enemy by far would be the Balron. No matter where you're standing, on a battle map they can cast a spell that puts a random number of your characters to sleep. You can spend precious turns casting spells of awakening on them, but by the time they wake up, the Balron is already putting them back to sleep. After a grueling effort, we finally reach the Shrine of Humility. I head back to my boat. My boat? Why is my boat gone? 
No problem, we're only across the entire map from the mainland. We'll just whitewater raft back to Britannia. Well, worry not, crew. I have a contingency plan for situations like this, and it's never let me down. Follow me, we're going to die in the mountains. Hi, Avatar. Hi, Lloyd British. So, what happened to I'd the- I'd rather not talk about it. Understood. According to Lord British, the next step in Avatar Hood is finding the Eight Stones deep within Britannia's dungeons and preparing for a descent into the Stygian Abyss. Let's try this dungeon. Okay, I'll go to a different one. There are eight dungeons in total, representing equal and opposite vices to the Eight Virtues. The Dungeon Covetous, for example, or the Dungeon Wrong. Dungeon crawling plays a major role in Ultima 4, and of every facet carried over from the previous games, this has probably undergone the most significant and the most positive changes. Like Ultima 3, the dungeons here are handmade rather than generated like the older games. They're navigated in the same way, first person perspective while exploring top down view when encountering enemies. The maps themselves are pretty small and don't have much by way of surprises if you've played the other games. You'll need torches from the Thieves Guild to light your way, dealing with traps, enemies, and finding loot on your way down to the 8th and final floor. What makes Ultima 4 interesting is how perspectives are blended in order to present unique challenges and layouts within each dungeon. The different segments of a dungeon are joined together by rooms, which, when looking at the dungeon map, appear to be generic hallways. However, entering those areas will shift the perspective from a first-person view to the familiar top-down view, dropping you into a representation of that dungeon area. The entryway you arrive in, as well as the potential exits to a room, are accurate to the dungeon tile, meaning if you travel south in the dungeon instance, you'll move to the grid south of the room itself on the dungeon map. So, this sounds like a bit of a no-brainer. Having these battle screens represent specific challenges and reflect the level's geography. But this is a huge leap forward in providing a cohesive experience where all of Ultima's different pieces fit together. Prior to this, we got generic battle screens with brick tile backgrounds, if we even got battle screens at all. These separate dungeon cells will all have unique preset challenges. Most of the time, you'll be facing off against some particular enemies, but scripted events will sometimes occur, changing the dynamic of battle. Moving to one half of the screen might trigger doors to open up or bridges to extend, forcing you to deal with unexpected opponents. There are often small puzzles in these rooms as well. Looking at the dungeon map, you should be able to continue in this direction from the dungeon cell. Yet, once you're inside, there's only one exit, and it takes you down another path. Opening sealed doorways is often a matter of searching each room thoroughly or defeating all enemies on the screen. Sometimes there are hidden paths located in the walls themselves, as denoted by this single white pixel. It's an almost imperceptible difference, so if you're not looking for it, you likely won't find it. It almost wouldn't be fair if not for the fact that you can see the dungeon map, via either gems from the Thieves Guild or a magic spell. Thanks to the reagent system, spells themselves are treated as valuable resources, not to be used carelessly. Some of the spells you'll be relying on towards the end of the game, such as Resurrect, which saves you from yet another awkward exchange with Lord British, or Tremor, which deals massive damage to all enemies on screen, require a pair of rarer reagents. Nightshade and Mandrake Root can only be found in a small handful of specific spots in Britannia, and only when both moons are new, and often not even then. Harvesting Mandrake Root in particular requires you to stand in a swamp, poisoning yourself, so you'll need to stock up on cure or healing spells and settle in for the long haul. Throw on a best of the worst or something, you'll be waiting for many new moons. <laughs> Ultima 4 isn't the game where you can take the pressure off of wizards with potions. That's because there are no potions or consumables really at all. The reagents for some of the more powerful spells are just short of necessary, as some of the more challenging dungeons will leave you battered, bruised, and clinging to life by a thread. The use of spells in navigation is incredibly important in Ultima 4. On the overworld map, you have spells like Gate Travel, which allows you to select a moon gate for instant fast travel no matter where you are. There's also Wind Change, which allows you to temporarily redirect wind in the direction of your choosing. In dungeons, you've got the usual spells like Up, Down, and Exit, which allows you to largely circumvent some of the more trivial dungeons in the game. 
There's also Dispel, which destroys various types of magical barriers, blocking your path. It's used in individual dungeon rooms as well as the connecting hallways. Spells like View and Light will serve the function of Thieves' Guild gear, and in a pinch, you'll always want plenty of cures and heals. Thankfully, the spell names are now simplified rather than reflecting an ancient language. For example, Heal is called Heal and mapped to H, rather than being called Sanctumani and being mapped to K as it was in Ultima 3. Tremor takes the place of Zixkihib, which is appreciated. In addition to spells, you'll also want plenty of food because son of a bitch Richard Y. The game finds creative ways to work within the dungeon's limited mechanics, offering up different challenges depending on which one you're in. The Dungeon Despise, for example, will take you lower and lower at a brisk pace, which seems like a good thing. But once you hit the lowest floor, you'll actually have to find other ladders back up in order to find the stone. You'll also have to find one secret wall, which reveals another secret wall, which then creates a bridge to the stone itself. I must have checked the map and re-entered this dungeon room about 20 times before I figured it out. But dad gummit, I did figure it out, and that makes me happy. Another such challenge is in the Dungeon of Wrong. One of the floors is full of strange winds that instantly put out your light, forcing you to fly blind or consult a dungeon map to navigate. The dungeon crawling of Ultima 4 is much more interesting, strategic, and lucrative than it's ever been in the series. Both the risks and the rewards are higher, and each of the eight dungeons, despite using the exact same tile sets and first-person graphics, feel distinct. The dungeon segments certainly aren't perfect. I'm so fucking tired of playing Ultima. I've just had enough of playing Ultima. Re-entering zones you've already cleared, for instance, will force you to deal with the exact same challenges, potentially over and over again. It's also incredibly annoying to move all eight characters around in a sequenced turn order. Rather than just allowing you to control the avatar once combat has ended, you need to move each party member one at a time, one square at a time. It feels like learning to use eight limbs at once, and by the end of the game it's exhausting. The quickness ability, thankfully, allows you to make more moves per turn, but it's not a particularly cheap spell to make. It's also odd that loot is only comprised of gold here. Ultima 3's treasure chests would often contain weapons or armor, but here it's gold only. I'm not sure why that change was made, but it makes stumbling across treasure chests much less exciting, especially if you're already at the gold cap of 9,999. But we're not here for gold, we're here for stones. Within most of the dungeons, you'll find a colored stone relating to one of the virtues, such as the yellow stone, which relates to compassion. Finding and reaching the dungeons can be quite a pain. Many are found down hidden channels on small islands, or are otherwise just out of the way. Thankfully, there are options to make things a bit easier. At the 8th level of every dungeon, you'll find an altar upon which you can place 4 stones. While you probably won't have the necessary stones yet, the altar room still serves an important purpose. These rooms connect with one another, allowing you easy access to other dungeons on the bottom floor. From there, you can climb to earlier floors in search of that dungeon stone. The white stone and black stone are different. As Merlin tells you, the black stone is caught in a moon gate, specifically the gate at Moonglow. You have to stand on the moon gate's tile and wait for both moons to be new, and then search for the black stone there. The white stone is stuck in the mountains, which gives you two options. The first requires you to make your way through the dungeon Hythloth an entrance for which is conveniently located underneath Castle Britannia. Once you escape Hythloth, you'll find the peak of British ingenuity. I'm not talking about jellied eels, I'm talking about the hot air balloon. Hop on in, press K to climb, and end up on the ass end of the map as far away from your goal as possible. The balloon allows you to circumvent mountains, oceans, and enemies, but the drawback is that you're entirely at the mercy of the wind. This is where the wind change spell comes in handy, although how long your wind change lasts appears to be basically random. Sometimes it's like 20 seconds, other times it changes back instantly, so you'll just be constantly recasting wind change in the middle of a flight, choosing the direction and descending when the balloon is over the perfect tile. Trust me when I say, it's never over the perfect tile. 
Trying to remember all these controls mid-flight is something else. C to cast magic, then select the number of the party member casting the magic, then W for wind change, uh, then select the direction the wind is coming from. Hold it, the direction the wind is coming from, not the direction you want the wind to go in. And you've probably overshot by now, so it's time to do it all over again. There is a simpler way to reach the white stone, if you can figure it out. There's a spell called Blink that I'd been avoiding for most of the game. That's because I remember Blink from the earlier Ultimas. It sent you to a random spot on your current dungeon floor, which is a degree of self-sabotage that even I can't get on board with. In Ultima 4, Blink actually works as a short-range teleport spell, usable on the overworld map only. You might think it just teleports you in a straight line, but nothing's ever that simple in Britannia. The Blink spell seems to count a certain number of tiles away from you in your chosen direction, and then moves backward ignoring impassable tiles until it finds a piece of traversable terrain and sends you there. Or, or something, I, I don't know. What I can tell you is that standing right here and blinking to the north will send you to a tiny spot in the mountains where you can find the white stone. With all of the stones in hand, you can at last return to the altars at the depths of each dungeon and place the stones on those altars in the correct sequence in order to receive the keys. The key of truth, the key of love, and the key of courage become tripartite in nature. One key that's simultaneously three keys. If that doesn't make sense to you, take it up with Aquinas. Returning to Lord British, the penultimate step of our quest is now to find the Bell of Courage, the Candle of Love, and the Book of Truth. While finding runes and companions takes you to the cities of Britannia and the keys to its dungeons, these endgame treasures will take you to the three institutions mentioned in the Book of History. The Lyceum, which represents Truth, Empath Abbey, Love, and Serpent's Castle, Courage, were established so that the citizens of Britannia might pursue higher callings scholarship, transcendence, and service to others. The Lyceum is an academic institution patronized mainly by wizards. Representing the high point of Britannian technology, there's a telescope here through which you can see other cities. It's just kind of a cool way to verify whether or not you've discovered every town yet. You'll also find Father Antos here, who last I saw was hanging out with Queen Susan on Planet X back in Ultima 2, which in retrospect is the most insane sentence I think I've said in this entire series so far. That geographical shift did hit hard though. He tells you that the Book of Truth can be found where the other books lie, which is your cue to once again crack open the Book of History and start reading to jog your memory. Other books lie, ah yes, the Lyceum Library, which is about 7 feet away from Father Antos. The Book of Truth can simply be found in its alphabetically organized shelves, exactly where it should be. Finding the bell requires a bit of sleuthing, as only a fighter named Garam knows where it is. He gives you the exact latitude and longitude of the bell. Its location in the ocean here is a bit conspicuous. I think it's reasonably likely that gut instinct would have you search here anyway. Unlike the candle, which is located in the hidden village of Cove inside of a pillar of fire getting sick of lighting myself on fire to prove I've got what it takes. If you've talked to everyone, and trust me, if you've made it here without a walkthrough, you've talked to everyone, you'll have heard tell of various other treasures scattered across Britannia. Finding these will make the journey through the Stygian Abyss more bearable, so it's a good idea to hunt them down. First of all, there's the Silver Horn, which allows you to bypass the endless demon hordes guarding the Shrine of Humility. I'm not mad that I didn't see that 12 hours ago, really. I'm not. I'm maintaining humility. I like the horn being useless for me. It makes a cool sound when you blow in it. Another treasure is the wheel of a shipwrecked vessel called the HMS Cape, which can be found in the Bay of Britannia's southern peninsula. Not entirely sure what it does, but it's said to have dormant powers, so it might be worth hanging on to. There's also the Mystic Armor, which can be found guarded by some hippies in Empath Abbey, as well as the Mystic Arms, which are just on the floor of the Serpent's Hold training room. I know most items are found on the ground in seemingly random places, but, uh, I mean, come on, the Mystic Arms? They were created by the Mastersmith Zircon and given to the Lord and Lady of the Keep. The utter disrespect of it all. The Mystic Equipment is extremely powerful and can be donned by any of your characters, including the Shepherd. I like that there's room for these adventures at the end. It makes you feel like an explorer, venturing into these castles, sailing to distant spots in the ocean. There's something weirdly captivating about pressing that search button and being told that you actually find something. 
It's also nice that finding these treasures awards the Avatar with experience points. Computer Gaming World offered a surprisingly lucid piece of criticism back in its day, stating that experience points in Ultima 4 should have come from the completion of certain tasks, dungeons, or quests, rather than almost solely from combat. I mean, the focus is on virtue, after all, right? I'm inclined to agree with this. I like that the artifact hunting results in some experience points, but I wish that this was extended to the game's many other quests. Of all Britannia's hidden treasures, few spark fear in the hearts of men quite like the skull of Mondain, found between three volcanoes in what is presumably Mondain's watery grave. Now last we saw Mondain, he turned into a bat, covered himself in Crisco, and ran away from us in circles. Of course, that was only an abstraction of his sheer malevolence. Mondain is so unbelievably powerful that his skull has the power to kill everyone. You can use the skull to kill every enemy on a given screen, but doing so will forfeit your progress in all eight virtues. That's how evil Mondain was. With that said, it's finally time to enter the Stygian Abyss. The entryway is guarded by a fleet of enemy ships, which can easily sink you. This is where the wheel of the HMS Cape comes in handy. Using the item will dramatically increase your ship's condition, allowing you to tank cannon fire and directly board your enemies without worrying. I love the idea that we're invoking the spirit of a once great vessel to embark on its final voyage, protecting us in the process. On the Isle of the Abyss, we have to traverse poisonous swamps before reaching the entrance located in the island's fiery center. Obviously, the representation is very simple, but it feels like we're reaching the final confrontation of an epic journey. Wait, enter can't? What do you mean enter can't? What need me do enter to dungeon? Of course, you have to ring the bell of courage, read aloud from the Book of Truth, light the candle of love, and lastly, toss the skull of Mondain into the abyss so that no one might use its dark power. Only then will the entrance be revealed. This is Ultima IV's most difficult challenge by far. Each floor of the dungeon contains gauntlets of rooms, often arranged into a maze full of the game's deadliest enemies. It's essentially required to make a ton of spells, it's easy to run out of dispels, tremors, or heals before you've made it to the last few floors. Leaving the abyss to get more reagents and coming back would be an arduous journey, so you'd better have what you need. Throughout all of these final dungeon challenges, you begin to feel the intangible sense of camaraderie with your party members. Sure, they've hardly said two words throughout the game, but you've been through so much together. Now it's down to the wire, embody all of the virtues and leave no one behind, not even the floor itself would stop you now. In order to move down from each floor, you must first find an altar and answer questions which test your knowledge of the eight virtues, as well as the principles from which they emanate. After placing the correct stone upon an altar, it transforms into a passage down to the next floor, where the cycle repeats itself until you reach the bottom. At the end of the abyss, the Avatar and their party will face a dark version of themselves, a fitting manifestation of Ultima IV's central challenge, the conquering of oneself. With nearly the full context of the game, I'd like to take a moment to talk about Ultima IV's more esoteric elements, the surprising depths which are plumbed by its narrative. Garriott made a conscious decision when designing the Eight Virtues. This wasn't to act as a religion in a traditional sense. Aside from the vague happenings in Britannia, such as the destruction of Magincia, the talk of a god or gods would be kept to a minimum. Of the many world religions he would study while developing the virtues, he would find the framework of Eastern spirituality most appealing. Weaving mysticism together with pragmatic life lessons seemed to embody his belief in the inherent goodness of people. Still though, aspects of religion would be used to create a believable foundation. Real religions are unfathomably complex. Literature, music, art, philosophy, and tradition act in self-referential ways, digestible to the lay person, but with much to discover underneath the surface. Without the contributions of hundreds of philosophers and practitioners over thousands of years, it's pretty hard to just come up with a religion. But insightful minds can make convincing facsimiles. And again, the eight virtues aren't meant to be a religion in and of themselves, but a system, an organization of truths that are hypothetically already there in the ether, waiting to be discovered by inquiring minds and embodied by an avatar. 
One component in making this system as convincing as possible was through the use of symbolism and iconography. Religious symbols are often used to simplify and rationalize more bewildering concepts. One such example in Ultima 4 would be the eight virtues themselves. During character creation, each of the virtues is represented by a scene on a tarot-like card. These would be simplified over time. Honesty is symbolized with an open hand, representing that one has nothing to hide from the world. Compassion is represented by a rose, symbolizing both the beauty of extending one's empathy towards others and the inevitable pain that can result from doing so. Valor is represented by the sword, a classic symbol of bravery and strength. Justice is represented by the scales, depicting a balance and fairness in all things. Sacrifice is symbolized by a crying eye, the open eye representing the overcoming of ignorance and the tear depicting the pain inherent in giving oneself to others. After all, if sacrifice were easy, well, it wouldn't be sacrifice. Honor is symbolized by the chalice, the base of which represents a forthright spirit and the fullness of its cup of stout heart. Humility is symbolized by a shepherd's staff, a tool used to perform their often thankless work and to lean upon when the body and soul are weary. Finally, spirituality is represented by the Ankh, the ancient Egyptian symbol representing life itself. Despite being only one of the eight virtues, the Ankh is the de facto symbol of Ultima IV and the virtue system. With each new enlightenment reached, a piece of the Ankh is added to the game window until it's finally completed. These eight symbols can be easily understood at first glance, but also contain some deeper meaning if you care to look a little closer. Ultima IV's ethical system itself is represented by the symbol of the Codex. Within a larger circle, two overlapping equilateral triangles of differing size contain three smaller circles and one especially small one between those three. The three circles represent the three guiding principles, truth, love, and courage, each one coded with a different color. From there, intersecting lines create sections in which each of the eight virtues are placed. From truth alone, there's honesty. From courage, valor. From love, compassion. Truth and love form justice. Love and courage form sacrifice. Truth and courage form honor, and all three together form spirituality. On the periphery of the circle, independent from the principles altogether, is humility. Together, these form the Codex, an effective visual representation for the virtues that's surprisingly complicated. Humility, for instance, seems to be an outlier. I mean, how is it disconnected from the principles? The rationale is that humility moderates the remaining virtues, as without it, courage, love, and truth can be taken to disturbing extremes, something that the series would later explore. Its existence outside of the principles is even reflected in-game. Every virtue has a town associated with it, except for humility. In our experience of it, the town of Magincia is the town of pride, hence why it no longer exists. In the absence of virtue and vice, humility is finally given a chance to flourish. The Codex is perhaps best understood through the use of Venn Diagram, which simplifies it further. Outside of the symbols and visual metaphors, Ultima IV is a game of eights. Eight towns, eight virtues, eight companions, eight professions, eight moon phases, eight stones. This adherence to the number eight gives the game a pattern and rhythm that feels organic while tying everything together nicely. Characters, cities, and dungeons can all be identified as relating to the world's ethical code, giving you a sense of direction and purpose when you feel overwhelmed. It's probably no coincidence that the number 8 has a great deal of religious significance that often directly relates to the world of Ultima IV. The Wheel of Dharma in Buddhism, with its eight spokes, represents the noble eightfold path. The right view, the right resolve, the right speech, the right conduct, the right livelihood, the right effort, the right mindfulness, and the right meditation. These principles often overlap with the eight virtues. The Taoist Bagua is represented with eight symbols, all corresponding to the fundamental nature of reality. In Judaism and Christianity, eight is a number representing a fresh start, being the day that God returned to his work after resting on the seventh. A microcosm of this being the benevolent work of Lord British, which has begun in earnest, having contended with the Age of Darkness. From the center of Britannia, the eight cardinal directions lead you to eight different cities, meaning no matter which direction you move in, enlightenment awaits. And enlightenment is exactly what you'll need to solve the final puzzle. 
First of all, you'll be asked, what is the word of passage? This is completely unrelated to the virtues, so it might stump you, unless you've been paying close attention to the dialogue thus far. Certain characters will tell you that a word of passage will be needed in the final gate of the abyss. Asking the people you meet about this word will reveal its three parts. Ver, the first syllable in the Latin versus, meaning truth. Amo, corresponding to amor, meaning love. And cor, short for courage. The word of passage, then, is veramocor. The passage opens, and the questions continue. You're once again tested on your understanding of the eight virtues. This time, rather than having to demonstrate your knowledge of the system, you're asked to show a primeval understanding of it. What dost thou possess if all may rely upon your every word? What quality compels one to share in the journeys of others? What answers when great deeds are called for? With each question answered correctly, the Codex of Ultimate Wisdom is further assembled in the darkness. Finally, with the Codex built, you're asked one final question, for which there are no dialogue clues. What is the one thing which encompasses and is the whole of all undeniable truth, unending love, and unyielding courage? From those three principles come eight virtues. Those eight virtues give rise to eights in all things, cities, companions, stones. Throughout your journey, you've been in many situations that have changed your perspective on Britannia and its virtues. And a changed perspective is exactly what's needed for eight to become infinity. The Stygian Abyss has been conquered. You have become the Avatar. But Avatarhood is not something to be taken for granted. It's a responsibility ad infinitum. The game ends in much the same way it began, with our Avatar being thrust into another world, this time their own, and this time with answers rather than questions. The main character of Ultima IV, our Avatar, who stumbled across the portal to another world, is a mirror being held up to ourselves. Ultima IV was our moon gate, and it truly did transport us to another world. We and our Avatar unexpectedly learned valuable lessons. The Eight Virtues are a reminder how we should act in accordance with the world around us. When we change ourselves, we change the world. Like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, the Avatar was brought back to their world after being enlightened with experience. So too do we shut down our computers and meditate on all we have learned, comfortable with the knowledge that Britannia is only a moon gate away. Robert Fripp is a guitarist who played for the band King Crimson. In 1969, the band released an album called In the Court of the Crimson King. It's widely considered to be one of the most influential albums of the 20th century and a formative work in the progressive rock genre. It's often said that the members of King Crimson were geniuses for writing the album, or that the album itself is genius. Fripp has pushed back on our idea of genius. In an artistic sense of the term, genius isn't a trait that most people can claim in perpetuity. After all, even Beethoven wasn't infallible. Rather, so says Fripp, genius is a spirit that visits people at particular times when it's needed most, and then it moves on. If this is true, then there's no doubt that the spirit of genius was visiting origin systems during the development of Ultima IV, Quest of the Avatar. There's something truly magical about the game an understated quest for enlightenment, incorporating real-world mysticism, symbology, and philosophy. It was simultaneously ahead of its time and the perfect game released at the perfect time, elevating the CRPG beyond the comfort zone in which it had begun to settle. In most of the ways that matter, time has been exceptionally kind to Ultima IV and further revealed what a special game it was. There would never again be anything quite like it, even within its own series. It was simply lightning in a bottle. You almost can't find an RPG these days without some manner of morality system or choice and consequence. That started with Ultima IV. Whether or not it was inevitable, one studio had to find the courage to defy industry conventions for the sake of advancing the medium, and that studio was Origin. They received letters from Ultima fans talking about how much fun it was to kill innocent people, and they said, no, you're meant to care about Ultima 4, not just care about beating the game, but care about the experience that it offers you. Its citizens, your comrades, its accessible yet thought-provoking moral teachings. You were meant to care, and people did. 
Ultima 4 made a lasting impact not only on the industry and RPGs in general, but on the individuals who played it. This game has changed people's lives. Over the years, many would approach Garia, testifying to the meaning this journey of self-discovery held in their lives. One mother sent Origin a letter of appreciation for creating something that had reached her troubled daughter, leading to self-reflection and self-improvement when all else had failed. Ultima 4 was a game that earnestly made people want to be better. To this day, many permanently mark themselves with the Codex of Ultimate Wisdom and discuss at length the virtues and their implications. Quest of the Avatar's greatest strengths exist outside of itself. The gameplay can be stiff and clunky, the conversation simplistic, and the quests a wild goose chase. In spite of that, Ultima 4's mechanics and narrative focus represented a substantial leap forward, one whose rippling effects can't be avoided even to this day. Richard Garriott was proud of Ultima 4. The fact that the game was a hit was just icing on the cake. Richard's anxiety in regard to its reception turned out to be unfounded, as players loved the game. Its suggested price was about $50 US, significantly more than the standard computer games at the time, but that didn't seem to matter. They'd spent two years on Ultima 4, pouring their blood, sweat, and tears into the project. The price they felt was justified, and it sent a message. This game is far beyond what the other guys are doing. Word of mouth substantiated the claim this game was worth the money. Over 300,000 copies of Ultima 4 were sold. Critics praised the game's inventive design, and it was the first game that managed to supplant Wizardry's dominance in the computer gaming world's Reader's Choice poll. Origin just became a real player, and they'd be here to stay. There'd be no time to slow down and enjoy their newfound success, however. While Ultima had shared shelf space with Wizardry and a few lower-profile RPGs, competition was about to become truly fierce. Tales of the Unknown, later retitled The Bard's Tale, released a few months following Ultima 4 for the Apple II and Commodore 64. This was the first big release from an up-and-coming studio called Interplay, and with it, they'd firmly placed their foot in the door of the CRPG world. The mechanics of The Bard's Tale were largely based upon designer and Interplay founder Brian Fargo's D&D experiences. The game's extensive magic system, depth of combat strategy, and complex exploration led to very positive reviews. The game would outsell Ultima 4 by a significant margin. In a particularly egregious power move, Interplay would even allow for your wizardry and Ultima 3 characters to be imported into the game. As mentioned earlier, Roe R. Adams III worked on both Ultima 4 and The Bard's Tale, so the town of Scarabray can be found in both games. Supposedly, there were further similarities, which had to be shelved due to presumably legal concerns. It seemed the number and quality of the CRPGs being released was increasing exponentially. The year following Ultima 4's completion would see the release of Might and Magic, The Bard's Tale 2, as well as several games from noted D&D collaborator Strategic Simulations. When Origin had started their operation in 1983, the video game crash had been in full effect. The console market was undergoing a massive recession, leading to an estimated 700,000 Atari cartridges being buried in landfills. Thankfully, PC markets, while still affected, were able to weather the storm and continue business as usual, more or less. Outside of these markets, though, something big was brewing. In 1983, a Japanese company called Nintendo had released their Family Computer System, or Famicom. Following in the footsteps of home video game consoles like the Atari 2600 and Intellivision, the Famicom would utilize state-of-the-art technology to usher in a new generation of cartridge-based gaming. Japan was largely unaffected by the video game crash, so the Famicom, despite having been released during its peak, was proving to be a massive success for Nintendo. A few years later, one month after the release of Ultima 4, the Famicom was released in North America as the Nintendo Entertainment System. It set the gaming world on fire, with almost 30 million systems sold during the 1980s. While the CRPG revolution was in full swing, the console RPG revolution was only just getting started. Game designer Yuji Horii had penned the concept for a game that would ultimately become Chunsoft's Dragon Quest. 
Released on the Famicom in 1986, Dragon Quest was a cultural phenomenon, and it had been chiefly inspired by Ultima and Wizardry. Those series were becoming surprisingly popular in Japan, with ports to the Japanese PC-8801 system selling well. Still, games like Ultima seemed unapproachable, even more so given the 228,000 yen price tag on that PC-88. Therefore, Hori's goal with Dragon Quest was to create something that would appeal to a wide audience, something that would take the arcane mechanics of CRPGs like Ultima and simplify them, focusing on storytelling and a vibrant world created by manga artist Akira Toriyama. It would be hard to argue that Chunsoft didn't succeed. Dragon Quest remains one of Japan's most beloved and recognizable properties, and it signified the dawn of the Japanese RPG. No matter where one looked, it was RPG madness. The larger this market became, the more developers came looking for their shot. If Origin wasn't going to put in the work, there were many others who would, so development on further games, including Ultima V, began almost immediately following Ultima IV's success. But where to go from here? Ultima IV challenged the player to act in accordance with the virtues in order to finish the game. Yet, in doing so, the player was, in essence, strong-armed into acting virtuously. This raised an interesting question. Is a good deed equally meaningful regardless of the heart and intention of the one performing it? More importantly, if one refuses to act virtuously, can morality be legislated? Next time on the Ultima Retrospective. Thanks very much for watching, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Ultima. This was definitely the most research heavy video I've had to make, probably ever, so I hope I did a reasonably good job organizing all the different information, making things interesting, etc. Weirdly enough, research is my favorite part of the process of making videos, so this was a particularly enjoyable one to make, actually. If you're interested in the music or the sources used in this video, please check out the description. There's a pastebin links there that'll hopefully show you what you need to know. I would of course like to thank my patrons. This channel is in rough shape without you all, and uh, I can't express my gratitude enough, honestly. If you're interested in becoming a patron, helping out the channel, maybe uh, check out some bonus videos. Just did a short review of Shadowgate 64, for example. Please consider checking out the Patreon link in the description. With YouTube, you never know, so every penny helps. And I'm always thinking of ways to challenge myself to make better content for you. I would also like to thank those of you in my persons of lordly caliber patron tier. Adam Safranco, Matthew Sean Dick, Banana Turnip, Avil and Hime Takamura, True Manalist, Spencer Kennelly, Smo Bun, John Turcott, Captain, Baby Squirrel, Shane Shack, Mr. Shifty, Buster Drew, Francois, Fanar, Fenrir Lives, Silvar, Olo Shadow, Guko, Jordan Laughlin, Jordan Miller, Hayden Hudson, Rocketman, Jay Hewn, Azure and Celia Midsummer, Destrega, Tepid Tag Tournament, James Adair, Sable Dragon Rook, Cameron himself, Heinel Hander, Kelly Slaughter, Zeta, Caleb the Wanderer, Nicholas Esposito, Stephen Clancy, Cat Poop Nachos, Chu, Isaac Hampton, Ben Augusto, Beta Zeta, NVTF, Worston Show, Kenny Mitchell, Magina, Ran Roman Pontifex Maximus Shalabardus IV, The Humble, Base Forever, Metallion, The Bloke, Hypnotoad Trance, Serpion, Dennis Uro, Oakvale Yokel, Chris Walker, Half Daft, Pantless Warrior, First Name M, Last Name, Isis Q, George Frankly, Crisis King, Matt Strauss, Deke Like Duke, Trans Rights, Mianarchy, Hirod Tuo, Samuel Dillon, Twispy. Thank you all very much for your exceptionally generous patronage. Let's face it, it would be pretty difficult to provide an equal amount of value to that Patreon level considering like even most streaming services at 13 bucks a month. I can't give you Breaking Bad, I'm just the guy. So the only real reason to be a person of lordly caliber is because you believe in what I'm doing. And all I can say is, I'm glad one of us does. No, I'm just kidding. I am humbled by your support in all seriousness. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody for watching. Till I see you next time, stay healthy, wealthy, and wise.